Uh, hello. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I did a sort of uh, lengthy video about how uh, collecting and specific, particularly uh, music collecting uh, became part of my life. And in the course of that video, I highlighted, uh, I think, one, maybe two uh, vinyl uh, records that I have here in Thailand. I, I have uh, a number of them, uh, about 200 in total, that I brought over on the boat uh, 27 years ago. I haven't really played them uh, that often because uh, difficult getting uh, the right environmental conditions here, coupled with the problems over turntables. Uh, so most of the time they uh, stayed in their boxes. Uh, but following a discussion with one uh, James Griffiths, who has supported my channel since uh, it began, and I also uh, enjoy his videos, he suggested it might be an idea if I put together some vinyl collection videos. So big deep breath, uh, I gave it some thought and I said, what the hell, let's do it. It's not really my style. I like to research. I like to get uh, some a lot of information. And I generally sort of uh, have uh, notes prompted on the computer screen. And then I create the story behind the record via that. But So this is going to be very different. I'm going to actually uh, use vinyl records. And I'm going to be putting them in front of the camera would you believe it and I'm gonna try and ad lib uh, so uh, this might become a complete disaster um, but uh, let's see what happens anyway basically I decided that to get one box out and I just lifted the first six uh, albums uh, in that box in no particular order uh, and so uh, those are the ones I'm gonna talk about uh, so let's get on to the first one, and I'm reaching down, and let's get it out. And here it is. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the debut album by one Captain Beefheart and the Bad Magic Band. Now, I bought this in 1970, and it wasn't the original release. There was uh, the original release, of course, was in 1967. Uh, Beefart had emerged in 64 uh, following a friendship with Frank Zappa. They went to college and they both then disappeared in separate directions when their project didn't work. And they set up their own bands. Of course, Frank uh, created the Mothers of Invention and uh, Don Van Vila as his real name is, uh, established the first uh, magic band, Captain Beerfart and the Magic Band. And the release in 67 was Safe as Milk. And uh, there was basically... Uh, uh, the, the style of music, has to be said, was really influenced massively by Delta Blues. Uh, and um, it was quite an astonishing record, really, all in all. Um, Alex Sinclair... Uh, John French and the third guy, hang on, I'm just going to consult my notes. First bit of notes of the day. Uh, Jerry Headley were the core of the band alongside Beefheart and his vocals. And he threw in some harmonica. So those three members basically were guitar, bass and drums. Uh, but when they got in the studio, uh, they got some help from... Uh, Ry Kuda uh, and uh, Russ Tintleman and they put together this uh, first album which was called Safe As Milk. Um, there had been two singles before this uh, album was released um, uh, when they were signed to AMM but by the time they got to do the album uh, that had fallen flat and so they were now uh, being uh, put forward by Buddha Records, which were part of Polydor. Uh, and uh, the original cover was not this. 
this was the reissue, as I say, that took uh, that took me out of my comfort zone in 1970, uh, uh, and uh, it uh, was on a budget price uh, 99 pence, uh, pence being uh, 101 pound. So it was dirt cheap. And following my uh, regular listening to the John Peel show uh, on uh, UK radio, uh, and he was always uh, pushing beef heart, um, particularly at that time, the uh, 70, it was um, Trout Mask Leprica. I decided to snap this up because it was so true, cheap. And I'm really pleased I did because uh, it's a really tremendous album. Uh, if you're into blues, but with a, a, a an originality that is hard to match, uh, who can re fail to recall electricity, which sort of uh, jumped out of the speakers at you, uh, and it was sort of it had some really strange. Uh, I'm going to the notes again. Uh, strange sort of. Uh, guitar sounds uh i'm glad it was another track that i really like i had a touch of doo-wop and there was also these uh, crazy singles uh called uh abba zabba and uh, uh the other one escapes me now oh goodbye Rare, Rare, not no yellow brick road not goodbye Rare, 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 Rare. so anyway that's my first one tremendous cover uh, uh of the band all dressed in shirt and tie uh so safe as milk but it was renamed in 70 dropout boogie by captain beefer and the magic band so we're off and here i am leaning down this is the second one i pulled out of that box i have to say that the um uh were inside covers were pretty sort of stuck not to the vinyl, but stuck to a paper. This is the problem with the intense humidity in this country. But this is the second one anyway uh, that I pulled out. It's uh, the third album by the Eagles called On the Border, uh, released in 1974. Um, the Eagles have become a big part of my life with the pr pr previous album, Desperado. I didn't really... Uh, spend much time on the uh debut but desperado because of its concept of uh the cowboy life and the uh life on the road the sort of similarity really caught my eye and i i really did play it to death and there was a, a romance connected with it as well which also uh enabled it to be played uh but following on i was on the border and uh this third album got a fair bit of play as well. There were three hit singles on here, uh, already gone, a best of my life. And the third one, uh, let me have a quick look. Uh, the third one, James Dean. Uh, and I, I love them all. Uh, it was a mixture really of uh, country sort of slow rock and country rock, uh, faster rock. Country ballads, I should have said. Um, but um, they also uh, had a, an additional musician on this album that they didn't have on the first two. One, uh, Don Feldner, who became the second guitar player. Uh, Bernie Leiden was still around and he still offered pedal steel guitar and uh, banjo. Uh, the songs were sort of shared out, really, between uh, the writing of the songs and the singing. Uh, but, you know, they were, all could sing, although the, the, the main singers, of course, were Don Henley and Glenn Frey. But Randy Mester chipped in with some vocals, wrote two tracks. Uh, Bernie Leiden wrote one and sang on one. And so, uh, you know, it was very democratic, although it has to be said sort of Frey and Henley probably did boss things. Um, and I, I really like this album. Uh, I played it to death at the time in 1974. Um, it hasn't uh, opened my ears up, though, for probably ooh, 30 years. Uh, but I still remember it, which, is, of course, is the main thing. So that's my second offering, then, on The Border by The Eagles. 
third offering then today in this first vinyls, vinyl collection videos. They're certainly not fines because they've been around for uh, more than half my life. Uh, this is uh, Slow Hand by Eric Clapton, released in 1977. I believe it was his sixth uh, offering. Let me just check. Sorry, fifth. Fifth studio album. Uh, and of course, uh, the title, uh, Slow Hand, was his evolved nickname as a guitar player. Uh, it was a tremendously successful album. Uh, came after two sort of indifferent ones, really. Um, there's one in every crowd and backless. I, I like both those albums, but... They didn't do that well. Uh, there were two hit singles of this album, Lay Down Sally and the uh, infamous uh, Wonderful Tonight, the slow sort of uh, acoustic-led ballad. Uh, I'll refer to that again in a bit. Uh, Rumour had it that in the studio, uh, Eric and his uh, cast of uh, many were at, uh, sort of in drunken stupor most of the time. Uh, which probably is not far from the truth. Um, standout tracks on this, though. Um, Cocaine, of course, uh, written by J.J. Kale. This got banned uh, in some countries. Uh, Argentina, I think, because it was uh, in implied that it was encouraging uh, people who listened to it to use. Uh, uh, it's a bit far-fetched, I think. But two great uh, back backing singers, uh, behind Eric's improving vocals. Uh, Yvonne Elliman and Marcy L Levy. Uh, cracking they are as well, to add that sort of soul uh, sort of feel to uh, some of the tracks. Carl Radell was still there from uh, the Dominoes. Uh, and uh, uh, what else have I got to say about it? I particularly like the core on side two which was really a very up-tempo, guitar-driven uh, song. Uh, really, uh, Eric certainly uh, got into that one with, with his shoulders pressed back, I guess. Uh, and back to Wonderful Tonight, of course, this became, uh, although it was written of, about his wife, it became almost a cult status following the death of his young child, Connor, who had that dreadful accident falling out of a, of a, a window uh, in a skyscraper. But anyway, Eric Clapton uh, has been a big part of my music life. Uh, I saw him live on one occasion uh, and it, it's still as vivid. And whenever a Clapton album comes along, I, I grab it quickly on, on digital. Uh, uh, the man can do no wrong, although politically I have some issues with him. But in terms of music, uh, absolutely superb. So that's my third offering. Uh, uh, let's move on then. Next offering for me, uh, this is the fourth offering, is uh, Bop Till You Drop by Ry Kuda, released in 1979. And it was his eighth uh, recording. Uh, Pretty prolific, really, through the 70s. And uh, I found him uh, early on in the 70s uh, involved with projects with uh, Captain Beefer, as previously mentioned, and also Little Feet. Um, a big fan of him. This album was the first uh, album that was digitally recorded in 32 track. Uh, so the sound was quite radically different. It's a great album, mainly covers uh, of sort of rhythm and blues and rock and roll uh, classics that people uh, have never heard of. Uh, of course, Riyadh. Um, it starts off with uh, Little Sister, which was done by Elvish, uh, and some other tracks that catch my eye. Um, Don't Mess Up A Good Time, where he duets with... Uh, and I, the name escapes me here. Anyway, it's a duet. The only track that isn't a cover written by Rye is Down in Hollywood. Uh, and it features Chaka Khan. And she was the, uh, the other uh, person duetting on that track I re recalled earlier. 
Uh, Rye, of course, Sly guitar is his uh, meat and potatoes. And he also conducts himself with, on violin. Uh, we also uh, heard on this album one Bobby King uh, on backing vocals, who then proceeded to be around forever in Rye Cooder's band. Jim Keltner on drums. That's a familiar name uh, in American uh, uh, recordings. And it's just a wonderful piece of work. Uh, but that could be said really for every Ry Kuda's album that's been released. And I've got most of them uh, either on uh, vinyl, uh, I've got some on cassette, and of course I've got lots on digital. So there we are. That's my fourth offering, Bop to the Drop by Ry Kuda. Fifth offering uh, on this, uh, well, monumental, monumental leap by me. Uh, into the vinyl community, uh, not cheating anymore with my digitals. Uh, but here it is it's uh, Lloyd Cole, and this uh, was his first stable album, sometimes called the X album. And you can see uh, vividly the X across his chest. Um, Lloyd Cole, um, this album was released in 1990. And the previous few years, he'd been the front man in an excellent British band called Lloyd Cole and the Commotions. Uh, I came to them uh, at the stage of their uh, debut album, Rattlesnakes. And if you haven't heard that, it's an absolutely super uh, uh, rock, country, uh, all-style singer-songwriter uh, piece of popular music. I think I've covered most of the genres on that. This guy knows how to write a song, put it that way, and he, his band uh, pretty solid. He brought one of them onto this album, the keyboard player, uh, and I'm, uh, Blair, Blair Cowan is the man's name, but the others were all American. He sort of relocated to New York City uh, two and a half years post uh, the demise of the commotions, uh, sorry, the last album by The Commotions called Mainstream. Uh, and um, basically, he put together uh, some really nice songs uh, that I, ha I do like, but they tend to be quite forgettable because they have uh, a certain similarity. But you've got to admire his singing talents and they are very, very well played. And he got some good musicians in uh, to create that uh, sort of sound. There is a bit of synthesizer thrown in here. And Lloyd also uh, does some harmonica and piano alongside his uh, rhythm guitar and acoustic guitar. So there, ha give it a shot. He has subsequently released oh, at, at least 10 more solo albums uh, down the years, uh, 30 years to do it. Yeah, probably, yeah, at least a dozen. And I've got most of them. I do like this guy. Uh, he's sort of honest. Uh, when I say that, he, you, you believe in his lyrical storytelling. Uh, okay, so that's my fifth offering. But the final one, I don't know how long this is, uh, but it's, I'm probably talking far longer than I thought I would. This is the final offering uh, on this first... Uh, vinyl uh, community, sort of vinyl collection of mine. Uh, I guess if we're doing six, uh, I might finish in about another 30 videos, God forbid. Uh, and I'm also going to start doing cassettes as well. So uh, my um, uploads might increase a bit as long as uh, this uh, humidity doesn't kill me off. Um, now here it is anyway. It's uh, Pictures at the Exhibition by Emerson, Leighton, Palmer. Uh, this was released in 1971. It was the second album released in that year. Uh, the other one being Tarkus, which was a studio album. This was a live album, and it was Emerson's and Lake's, uh, and Palmer, of course, their uh, take on the classical uh, piece by Mussorgsky, of the same name and uh, uh, 
it was a rock adaptation, of course, of that. Uh, and they recorded it at uh, City Hall in Newcastle uh, in March 1971. And it was released as a budget uh, uh, record, very, very cheap, uh, under a pound, I seem to recall. And so that's the reason why I bought it. But once I listened to it, I was not disappointed. Um, uh, of course, it's heavily uh, driven by Emerson's uh, keyboards and synthesizers. And he his, uh, was an absolute uh, magician, really, in that department. But uh, countering that was uh, Lake's uh, tasteful lyrics and his delicate bass playing. And uh, he does a lovely version of the Sage uh, between two awesome uh, keyboard extravaganza uh, tracks. Uh, the titles are all uh, based on Mussorgsky's work. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, very, very good piece of work. But confession time. Uh, I did listen to it about a year ago, half of it. L thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, but not on vinyl, of course. So there we are. That's my final offering. And uh, so there we are. Six vinyl uh, records from my collection. The earliest, uh, uh, 67, I uh, bought in 70, to uh, the coal one in 90. Uh, there wasn't a lot of vinyl after 1990 in my collection. Uh, it has to be said. Uh, I think that was one of the last ones that I picked up uh, before. Uh, well, I, I, there were a few more. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I made, made a mistake there. In 1997, really, uh, was when I finally put vinyl behind me. So that's my lot. <laughs>